For courses exploring the foundation of modern philosophy, as well as live events bringing philosophy to life, visit philosophyportal.online and become a member today. Throughout 2024, our members get access to four monthly events. In March, we focus on the concept of the sacred and welcome guests Andrew Davis, Ruth E. Kastner, and Matthew Segal. Find out more at philosophyportal.online. Welcome to another Philosophical Conversation. My name is Cadell Last, and I'm here today with two very special guests, Dr. Dwayne Roussel, as well as Dr. Mark Gerard Murphy, who's a friend of the channel. We discussed his book, The Direction of Desire, a few months ago. Dr. Dwayne Roussel is a practicing Lacanian psychoanalyst. I Although I've had many discussions about Lacan and psychoanalysis, I think this is the first time I've had a practicing Lacanian psychoanalysis on the on the program. He's also an associate professor at Aga Khan University, as some of his recent publications include Post-Anarchism and Psychoanalysis from 2023, Real Love from 2021, as well as Gender, Sexuality, and Subjectivity in 2020. Today, we're going to be discussing a edited volume uh, edited by both Dwayne Roussel and Mark Gerard Murphy, uh, Negativity and Psychoanalysis. First off, welcome to the uh, welcome to the podcast, both of you. And uh, yeah, let's let's start with why negativity and psychoanalysis. Dwayne, you want to jump off here? Sure. Um, well, I think one of the questions that I've been bringing to a lot of cartel work uh, had to do with the the concept of negativity, whether it was a concept, a psychoanalytic concept, or not. Um, and in some of the, let's say, the Lacanian-inspired philosophy, uh, cultural uh, studies work, uh, literature, and so on that I'd been reading, I found uh, the concept of negativity was sometimes being used in a way where it was ossifying as a concept. And I think I wanted to put it back into circulation. I wanted to raise the question, uh, what... Uh, what what is negativity in psychoanalysis from Freud to Lacan, but also in Lacan's very last teaching? And what is positivity in psychoanalysis? The latter question, unfortunately, was only picked up in the book by a few of our uh, contributors, but I think that they've made a really good um, uh, contribution and intervention in the work that they've done. Uh, so I, I think that that's it. I mean, I wrote in the preface uh, something here uh, I found that in some theories of the death drive, for example, what had been described as negative seemed to me to be actually resolutely positive, positive in the sense of being a crystallization or a fixation of jouissance that they were describing. So when we talk about, for example, trauma, I think what's that, or war, I think what's at stake is actually something quite positive. It's a refusal to relinquish something of our enjoyment. That's positive, Shuasant, in a sense. When we speak about negativity in, in, in a time of war, for example, I don't think there's much of it. I think, in fact, in a time of war, we probably could use a healthy dose of negativity. You know, uh, something that would interfere with our certainties, our presuppositions, and so on, so that we could relinquish something of our uh, uh, enjoyment in certain meanings that were we've been taken for granted. So that's kind of um, where I was going with it. But I, I, I'd like to hear uh, Mark's thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the book well, we came about when uh, you know you and I were doing work together, and you know, as we were writing and reading, we realized we came up against this wall. You know, Lacan speaks of walls, this sort of density. Um, and the density of jouissance, this idea that what we're talking about or how people use various heuristic devices to analyze uh, cultural artifacts or political realities. They were using terms of you know, negativity, whether that's from an existentialist phenomenology or Hegelian dialectic, or even um, a clinical preference for like the middle Lacan. You know, these ideas of tr trying to interpret various aspects of what's happening in the world in terms of uh negativity and it as we were doing work we realized that this uh, you know reality that's like hit right in front of us is that it's it's difficult to speak about this stuff 
um uh, you know we want to be able to what we're talking about is something essentially positive and you used a great term in terms of uh, the way we uh utilize these categories of negativity to analyze something and in the process of analyzing these things we lose something we lose a way of speaking and you called it the phone nay the, the false the false negative and you know I think what the, as we were uh, we were talking about it, we came up with various uh, ways of being able to frame it, whether it's in questions of sat saturation and others. And eventually, we 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 realised that part of the problem is that we have this sort of putative split, you know, in, in between the clinic and theory, um, clinic and theory, and what you know, as we were discussing this idea, we wanted to be able to bring people together in a book to show that this. Uh, split between uh, the you know the theoretical philosophical cultural Lacan and the clinical Lacan on here there needs to be more unity and difference more discussion about uh, the way we're framing things and a new way to be able to discuss uh, the era that we're in the era as you succinctly put in many great essays Dwayne um, the, the era of jouissance as such and I feel I feel vindicated you know, I feel that the book, you know, in terms of we're talking about positivity, because there's been a few books of already that have, have come out. Uh, you know, we've been, you know, various interventions that we've made in terms of looking at questions of positivity and um, Bonet and whatnot. But other other works have come out recently talking about, you know, the culture of immediacy that we're in, that we've lost mediation. We're talking like Anna Clombo's book on immediation, the style of too late capitalism. And uh, the sort of saturated jouissance that's that's everywhere, but also you can see it in the sort of contemplative philosophy of Byung Chul Han. You know, he's talking about um, the the transparency society and how there's no mediation. And what we're talking about is ultimately a, a type of degeneration in the social bond, a type of positivity that's that's everywhere. And I think you know the book itself, and as you 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 succinctly, succinctly pointed out just now that the question was about that, the relation of negativity, a way of, re of talking about negativity, about looking at the value of it in theory and looking at its place within the clinic. And, you know, we circle around that and you can sort of see within the, um, the various uh, texts, uh, you know, whether that's, you know, we've got uh, like Sergio Benedetto and Todd McGowan are talking about the death drive. The, the question is there in terms of how it's framing it. Um, but yeah, I think uh, you know it's I I, I really I, th I think it's a good work. You know, I'm I'm I'm, I'm it's my first edited volume, so I, I thank Dwayne for allowing me to come on to do this. A little uh, biased. <laughs> <laughs> a little good bias. No, it's, I I think it's I think it is a, a timely volume, and it's timely. Also, I could situate it in the context of a lot of the conversations that I've been having in the last year with people more philosophically oriented by psychoanalysis than I haven't had as many discussions with um, clinically oriented theorists and I would I would like to and I'm, and I'm glad that your text is trying to sort of bring both the clinical Lacan and the philosophical theoretical Lacan or opening up the conditions of possibility for a deeper and a, and a richer conversation between those two ends. I think before we go too deep, however, into the into the text, I think we should approach something that I think has already come up in both what you were pointing towards, Dwayne, and and you as well, Mark, with perhaps a paradoxical sort of dimension of the way psychoanalysis conceives of negativity and positivity. Um, in in one of your articles that you cited, Dwayne, in your in your introductions, um, the the article, the deep positivity of false negativity, you you state. The negativity of our times remains saturated in the positivity of jouissance, which I think is a beautiful <laughs> description, but it might be confusing for people to think about what you're pointing at there. Um, it, it might have something deeply related to what Mark was pointing towards with the loss of mediation and this sort of saturation of immediacy that we find ourselves in. But if you would mind elaborating on that, I think that would be a great first step before we go deeper into the text. Uh, I'd have a hard time. I write these things very quickly and I don't remember them. And I I barely agree with anything I've written immediately after I throw it out into the world. 
Um, but I think I was just, uh, I don't remember this quote and I don't remember the essay at all. Uh, but it sounds like what I was pointing at was this idea of calling something negative when what's actually at stake in the theory of negativity that we're reading or hearing about is actually profoundly positive in the sense of there's an enjoyment at stake, um, uh, which one will not relinquish. To me, it, it's that's simply it. Um, so it, it becomes a question of how to reintroduce something negative. And in the very last Lacan, I think there's a gesture toward trauma as a way to reintroduce negativity, a, trauma, a traumatization, which in the French, um, there's an equivocation of whole and trauma, whole, is, uh, whole and trauma. So something needs to be punctured. And when I go back and I read Freud, for example, uh, in his essay, uh, where he introduces death drive uh, beyond the pleasure principle. Uh, he's describing at one point, and I might be incorrect because, again, it's from my memory, but he's describing something like, a, 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 like a, an organism, a cell with a membrane, and the membrane refuses to be punctured. To be punctured is the traumatization. Punctured by what? The signifier. And by the signifier, I think um, uh, in the very last Lacan, the signifier that we had come to associate with uh, the symbolic in the earlier uh, periods of, of Lacan's teaching, I think becomes something out of reach. Um, the signifier becomes saturated in jouissance. Uh, instead of being somehow separated from Jouissant's or a, a manner through which we would uh, prohibit something of the Jouissant's. It doesn't function in this way anymore. And the reason it doesn't function in this way anymore is because Lacan's moving away from the idea of the nom de père, the name of the father, as the anchoring principle of his Baromian knot or of his uh, Dis of discourse and these sorts of things. And he's moving more and more toward the pervasiveness of Jewish songs. Yeah, I mean- I, I, Yeah, I, go I, go for it, Mark. No, I, I think, and there's an anxiety, you know, that comes with it. You know, we're talking, you know, we're, uh, you know, for like seminar 24, which is, you know, you can sort of see the uh, seminar 23, there is a tentative, uh, hope if you wish on the question of the synthome but then you realize that with the question of the synthome and notting there is this sort of isolation you know Joyce is just he doesn't give a shit about love you know he's like what's it called he's happy type in a way and you know that the question of artifice the synthome isolate yes it holds together but at what expense and so uh, there is this notting but in when you come to seminar 24 there is you know how do we step away from this this oneness, this isolation, this uh, saturation of of the symptom, if you wish, and you know the the you know the the one blunder. Uh, it's called. It was that, that the right term for it? The the, the unbewusst. The uh, the the, the um, how do we escape from the one blunder? It is precisely what you're saying. It's this idea that there has to be, you know, a dream almost of of punctuation, a dream of the negative. Maybe that's what we you know we have in many of these you know theories that constantly hark back or constantly um, reiterating or iteration iterating the negative, constantly going. It's this. It's the dream of punctuation. It's a dream of a way of trying to be able to uh, step out and create a social bond. Um, mm. But the um, I think you know that that dream in itself necessitates a type of repression. In terms of what's not being looked at, and I, as I said, I think that you know there's certain people out there who are you know beginning to to, to see it and to, to, to point it out. It's the question of this immediacy, the way that when these uh, the way that we're speaking about many of the problems that we have today, we're utilizing these old categories, clinical categories, you know, whether Hegelian categories, uh, you know, whether we're talking about the um, uh, questions of segmentation categories or first principles, a general casuistry uh, that's everywhere trying to articulate what's happening. 
but this sort of uh, way of being able to articulate what's happening necessitates uh, not looking at the fullness in front of us, the oneness, the something of the one that's there. And that something of the one is one of flow. It's one of flux. It's one of immediacy. It's there. And, you know, when we're talking about the reality of that saturation, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about things like uh, generalized foreclosure. That, that's that. That's what. As soon as you start talking about that, that's when all the uh, various Lacanians go, "No, you can't say that because it means that everyone's psychotic." And that's not what it means. It means that there's a suspicion of these ways of framing things, these various first principles, the casuistry of the clinic, you know, and, and the endless uh, uh, sedimentation. And what did you say before, Dwight? Ossification of these categories. We have to be able to approach. Uh, the immediacy of the one uh, with the singularity it deserves. It means approaching it and taking it one by one. It means that, you know, maybe these categories that we can speak of offer an orientation or a trajectory, a way of speaking about these things, but we don't take them as uh, in the logic of the all, you know, it means, that, and that's what I think I, you definitely get this from um, what's uh, Jacques Alain Miller's, uh, uh, paradigms of jouissance. He talks about that. Anyway, I'm rattling on. I'll, I'll, if anyone else wants to ask any questions, I apologize. I, I was just going to add, if if I may, uh, that uh, we can already see something of a similar trajectory in Freud's work. If you go from the interpretation of dreams, dreams being a space where you can get some sort of enjoyment that you weren't able to get in waking life. In other words, in waking life, you're confronted with this was Freud's Oedipal wet dream. You, you were confronted with obstacles, you know, the prohibition of the father and these sorts of things, but you get uh, some sort of enjoyment in your dreams. You get satisfaction by dreaming. This was Freud's original idea. So dreaming was a dwelling space for enjoyment. You could say a space without mediation, but it depends what we mean by mediation or where we place, what register we place mediation in. But there's two points here. The first one is that what type of negativity is Freud discussing when he's talking about the dream work? It's a phoneg, and it's called censorship. Phoneg is a homophony that I invented spontaneously once uh, while I was talking to people on a podcast. I think um, some people call me mercurial. My personality shifts. Sometimes I wake up. Uh, <laughs> and... Um, Phoneg, it sounds like fawning, like you're really puffing your chest, you know, showing off a bit. Um, in the censorship of the dream work, it's a false negativity because the censorship is the security of the satisfactions of the dream. The censorship in the dream work, namely displacement, condensation, secondary revision, um, uh, significant representation, and so on, these were ways to keep you from waking up. In other words, to prolong your satisfaction. So it's a fake negativity. Yeah, that, the whole father, does, father and burning story. Is that, that the one? Yes. yes. What, what Freud does is he moves from the interpretation of dreams to the analyses of symptoms. And when he's describing symptoms, these are in some sense satisfactions that have been transported into waking life, which means that there is something in waking life that we can have access to, that we can call satisfaction, jouissance that is not relinquished. And so in some sense, symptoms were Freud's way of saying we dream in waking life. There is something, I love the expression I know uses, maybe it comes from Jacques Alain Miller, it's non-negativizable jouissance rather than positive. Maybe it's a better expression. There is something in the symptom. Um, and where Freud goes from there is quite interesting. At some point, Freud becomes what Todd de Fresne uh, calls a sociologist, right? Because he, be he begins to write a civilization and its discontents. He begins to write totem and taboo. He's writing these works about society rather than the dwelling space of sleep. So he goes out there. Mm -hmm. and, and so this idea of the pervasiveness of Jewissance, of something that is non-negativizable, again, I, I have to cite I know her essay, um, is one of my, really one of my favorites in the volume. Um, uh, it's already there in Freud. It might not have been Freud's dream, but it was there. Uh, 
apologies for uh, speaking over you, Mark. No, no, no I mean, it's right, it's right. Yeah, I mean, this is this is a fantastic start, um, and I think that it's it's it is interesting to think about the differences between jouissance as positive positive versus jouissance as non negativizable. I think there is a sort of let's say negation of negation at work in that concept of jouissance that we might want to stay with. I want to sort of introduce that since I've been doing work at Philosophy Portal, one of the things that I often say when I start lectures is that Philosophy Portal is a space for conceptual mediation and absolute negativity. And I see that as in some sense, a fragile and vulnerable attempt to introduce some figure of the name of the father. And it seems like that's kind of what's at stake here. And, and I want to sort of zero in on, on what might be at stake here socially, not just sort of individually or psychically, is being in a society where we're saturated by the positive or saturated by the non-negativizable jouissance. And your sort of affirmation that maybe Freud and certainly the late Lacan is moving away from models which, as it were, hold the knot together by the name of the father and move into this saturation of jouissance is how do you understand this relationship today in your own work and what you see in the work of Lacanians between the name of the father and this saturation of jouissance? Maybe okay. Dwayne, if you want to take that, or Mark, either of you, if you want to take that question. Go ahead, Mark. I can well. So, from my own, uh, I don't. Uh, my own thing is I'm I'm a theologian and I, I work in the theology and philosophy. And specifically, I teach uh, courses on philosophy, mystical theology, and spirituality. Now, the value, of, you know, for for you know, looking at Lacan in relation to this, and you know, this is uh, it's interesting that this book, you know, coming out negativity and psychoanalysis, because I first released my my first book, which is very much you know stuck in the middle. Lacan. It's about negativity, and then I come, and then I negate that with with uh, some of this stuff that's coming out. Question of, of positivity, but the work itself, um, I find within spirituality, is that you you find people coming uh, asking questions about you know spiritual questions. It's intensely positive. It's intensely positive. It's this uh, relationship to the question of spirituality. And you'll always find that spiritual directors within the, the question of, of pastoral theology as such, it's always related to questions of psychology. But there is a conscientious grip of certain modalities of psychology to keep questions of spirituality in this mo a mode of enjoyment that is intensely positive. Now, one of the big questions, you know, after putting this book together and doing the work with Dwayne, the question that came to me is like, if... If uh, Christianity or Catholic Christian spiritual direction, spirituality is presented just as another uh, positivized object in the in a field of endless other positivized objects, then what what difference does it make? What different? What positive? What uh, possible difference can it make if it's just trapped within this um, highly secularized expression of? positive experientialism or what we call positive uh toxic what Colin White calls in the book uh, toxic positivity and so yeah the dream of the negative um a way of being able to find ways of talking and framing a negative that gives up or finds a way of relinquishing uh, a, a type of jouissance that's the work and I think half the work is is uh, is exploring our dream of what the negative is. And I think if you go back and you read uh, the mystical theologians or myst people like John of the Cross, uh, Teresa of Avila, or, or you know, pseudo Dionysus, Meister Eckhart, there is always this iteration or a focus on what we see as negative isn't ever really negative. It's a fullness, it's an apophatic fullness. And so if you don't take that into account, you know, this uh, disruption to imminence as such, then you are ultimately going to find yourself going back and caught in a cycle. I don't know if that quite answers the question. <laughs> uh, 
but I'll 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 pass on uh, to Dwayne. Maybe he can answer a bit better. <laughs> um, I'll have to try and invent an answer. I'm not sure I fully got the question, but I get what I'm trying to... a little bit, if that's okay. Uh, what what I'm trying to what I'm trying to center, maybe if it, if if it, if it wasn't clear, is is kind of what you were talking about with the name of the father holding together the Boromian knot and this mm -hmm. drifting away from that model into sort of a saturation and jouissance. And what's at stake there? And how do you see this? How do you see these positions playing out in the Lacanian field today? Uh, it's a very big question. I could go in any number of directions. If I may, I'd like to begin with something Lacan said in his seminar, or worse, which is in French. Um, uh, it sounds like you're saying uh, the father when you say or worse in French. In fact, I think the title is meant to evoke the missing place of the father. That's the ellipses or worse. So it's the father or worse. But what's worse for Lacan, we can see it toward the end of the seminar, particularly at the very end, which is a bit of a surprise. It was a surprise for me. It's what he called um, the comrades, the peers, the fraternities. Mm -hmm. the, com uh, the, the brothers, the siblings, uh, there's an underappreciated concept, and I'm trying to elevate it as a concept in the Lacanian field. I haven't read it anywhere where anybody's picked this up yet. It emerges in this seminar, or worse, and it's not the name of the father, but the prerequisite for any acceptance by the speaking being as a subject for the name of the father, and it's what Lacan called the wow of the father. The name of the father, we tend to think about it as a signifier that gets deposited, accepted by the, the child as a speaking being. And then he's inaugurated into discourse, into uh, language as we understand it, as Chomsky perhaps would understand language, this sort of thing. Um, but before that's even possible, the miracle is that the subject accepts something like that. So there has to be a clearing of jouissance for the non de pair to be accepted. And that clearing in the domain of the drive, the jouissance of the drive, is what Lacan called the wow of the father. What's fascinating is at this time in the seminar, Lacan said, uh, he, he seemed to prophesize that the name of the father would not be the dominant principle of the coming contemporary era of the social bond as such. He says, and I paraphrase, if they're not wowed by the father, they'll be wowed by others, lowercase o, not capital O, to indicate the imaginary others, the brothers, the comrades, the newest social movements, the schools, the, what in sociology we call the secondary social groups rather than the primary social group, which was again Freud's Oedipal dream um, anchored by the father. So the, the, the place of what before had been the name of the father, uh, it becomes replaced with the principle of fraternity. And what happens is instead of being, let's say, uh, castrated to put it simply and naively by the social bond as one, one's ad, uh, admission into a social order, into discourse, you know, this idea that now we're, we have some sort of constitutive lack, it's replaced by a refusal to relinquish jouissance and jouissance as the principle of a cut from the world. So we're not cut within a social bond, we're cut between social bonds. Mm -hmm. This was Lacan's genius to see that if we're not cut by the father, we're cut uh, by the real, between social groups. Right, and right. so in, instead of it being a Hegelian world, oh, my, my internet's unstable. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just say one more thing and then I'll stop. Um, instead of existing in this uh, Marxist world, this somewhat Hegelian world, um, the world of modern thought, um, which is a world anchored by a key or chief uh, uh, principle of power, uh, instead of this being the, the, the sort of social order, um, we are now segregated from other worlds. And so ultimately what Lacan had pointed to in place of the name of the father is a principle of segregation, 
uh, which means that we become sort of uh, introverted, isolated. We form social bonds together alone. That's how Lacan put it. We are isolated together. No, no, that, that's, uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, I know, again, she, she put that in another essay, uh, you know, the question of being alone together. And, you know, what you're, you're speaking about there, you know, it's, 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 Hardly read, uh, you know, Marie Helen Bush. She talks about the iron bond of the social, precisely under what you're talking about. This, this, uh, the fraternity. It's not that we've given up. I think there is a like a nice. Uh, we have the, a, 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 an idea in our head that we have the, you know, the paternal order, you know, the traditional world, you know, the Kantian uh, duty bound subject, and then all of a sudden that's fallen fallen apart, and now we've got this sort of. Deleuzian, libidinal world of flux and everything's good, but that's wrong. What's what's what uh, Rouge and what you've just said succinctly is that this uh, social order or non-social order, if you wish, of of the of the fraternity is actually more brutal in in the uh, the categorical imperative that it thrusts upon people. You know, I, I know you've given a great essay as well i remember on 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 how that lo that law of the iron bond of the social that comes from this uh, world of segregation um the fraternal order how it works by affirmation right do you, you wrote this do you, uh, do you remember is it or uh, it works by affirmation instead of negation so people does that i remember but the point is is that it's there's a return in the real. It's this idea of um, it's even more brutal in terms of what it demands from us. There's a super ego injunction. So to answer your question, Kadat, um, or I think uh, is what's at stake? Well, you know, I think that what's at stake is a way of being, you know, a way of stepping out, a way of, and it's very simple. You know, I think, oh, but you know, simple in terms of trying to create a modality where we can speak where we can reach out where you know uh the, there is this quite and you know seminar 23 it's a question of invention of invention um you know it's a way of, that that it's a way of being able um if we're if we're addressing the question of negativity it's a dream of negativity it's a way of well how can we introduce something where we can continue to speak where we can reach out to others in a world which is ultimately you know in a state of saturated jouissance and segregation and the you know and you've said it succinctly there Cadell, isolate uh, uh, you said it sorry isolation one of the big questions for me you know with regards to the question of mystical theology and its relation to psychoanalysis is how can we transform isolation into solitude um because solitude is ultimately different from isolation Solitude at least always has the potential of reaching out to another. There's a there's a potential there, whilst isolation doesn't. Um, and I, I try to articulate that with questions of um, Julian of Norwich, um, but I've done it in other where, where I speak of her as as uh, someone different from from Ant Antigone, um, where she, Antigone goes into the cave. Um, and she, you know, it's and she dies. But what what uh, uh, Julian of Norwich does? She dies to herself. She dies, and you know, through whatever whatever sort of mystical process that you want to call it, from there, from this isolation of one and relinquishing a type of jouissance, a community builds up around her. You know, it's um, and you know, you can go there if you go to Norwich today, and you can see all the uh, the community that built up around this place where she sealed herself in into this small hovel or hole she immured herself and so by dying to herself and giving up a certain type of jouissance a social order was created obviously it's we're talking metaphorically i don't expect people to go and seal themselves in walls you know? <laughs> but it's a question of um how can we step out from the one how can we step up, step away from the symptom how can we how can we relinquish a certain modality of jouissance that ultimately stops or precludes our ability to speak and reach out to each other. I think that that's well, it's it's in the book, but it's a question that you, Dwayne and I have have circled around in 
myself from, as a from a more theological perspective and Dwayne from a social more uh, Lacan, uh, Lacanian analytic perspective and sociological perspective it's a question that's constantly we're circling around spiraling around if you wish um that's fantastic no this is this is really good stuff um i think this is i can't even overstate how valuable i think that the conversation is that we're opening so i'd i'd like to to stay with it um some of the things that are coming to my mind that are just sort of alive for me in in what both of you said is uh, in the last two years, I've I've switched a lot from talking about the move from loneliness to aloneness, which seems to be something like the relationship between isolation and solitude that you were pointing towards, Mark, um, and the conditions of possibility for cultivating that sort of aloneness, which has within itself the capacity to, to start reaching out to others again. Um, a lot of what's been going on at Philosophy Portal, and, and at least in terms of you know, my my thinking process with it is not just the conceptual mediation, but also the inventing new ways of speaking with each other. I think there's a lot at stake in that invention process. And, you know, perhaps the stakes there, I'd want to zero in on this and maybe get a further explication, maybe from both a sociological angle with Duane and maybe also a theological angle with Mark, is this wow factor that you're talking about, Duane is that if we aren't wowed by the father, then we're wowed by the fraternity. And that the being wowed by the father is perhaps perceived as in some sense negative, but what's worse is the fraternity. You know, what's more social is the father and what's less less social or even non-social is, is the fraternity. Am I, am I getting that right? Or how would you elaborate on that? Uh, I think they're both principles of sociality, but each um, operates according to a, a different point of departure. One isolates together. Uh, the other one um, uh, imagines a lack, uh, perhaps uh, leads to hysterical outbursts, revolutions, and these sorts of things that we saw in the modern period modern period was a period of revolutions. Um, but there's a third uh, principle, and that's the principle of the symptom. Uh, the idea is not to eradicate the symptom or cure the symptom, uh, yet we're also not trying to depathologize, um, as because depatholo uh, depathologizing is part of the common discourse today. Uh, but there is a, a, a bone of the symptom that is permitted. Um, when I think of Lacan, I think of Lacan as a sociologist. I hesitate to say it because sociology is quite the bad word among clinicians, and psychoanalysis is an even worse word among sociologists, uh, especially American sociologists. Uh, if you look at the history of American sociology, you see that everybody basically had uh, had a conception of psychoanalysis uh, that was uh, naive at best. Uh, most of them thought it was a type of uh, way of reintroducing biology. Um, there was very few. Talcott Parsons was probably one of the only who went into training, but he, he had a particular orientation. Lacan was a sociologist, and you can see it in one of his crowning achievements, which was his school. His school was an answer to a social bond that would neither be organized vertically by the father, nor would it be organized horizontally by the siblings, the brothers, the peers. So neither would we accept the non de, non -de pair, nor would we accept the non de peers. Instead, he wanted to pierce all of that, and he wanted to uh, introduce uh, as he put it, to restore the cutting edge of psychoanalytic experience uh, through the school. And if you look at the logical way in which he had implemented his school, uh, he called it my school, which is a first person possessive determiner, my school, my symptom, he should have said. Um, it began with an act. And the act 
the Founding Act, 1964, I think June, um, he began with what statement? I, as alone as I ever was in my relation to the psychoanalytic cause or experience, something like this, I paraphrase, alone. The act is alone. You, you act in isolation. Right? It's a lonely act. And then he moved in 1967 to the proposition. Uh, I'm basically paraphrasing in my own way an argument that Jacques Alain Miller presented in his course of 1989-1990, The Analyst Banquet. Um, Lacan moved to the proposition. And a proposition, if you understand the word, it means a proposition to another. So there's a sense of others there. So he's moving from the contingency of his isolation to the necessity of including other people into a school and addressing them and including them and to allow them to, uh, to confront the cutting edge of their own psychoanalytic experience in the act via the proposition of the past. That's 1967. In 1980, he wrote a letter of dissolution to Le Monde in France. Um, he dissolved his school. And what's fascinating in this moment is he's not alone. He's with others, but he, he's isolating from others. It's a sociological principle because I think the dissolution of his school was the school in its nascent state, which means was the school in its purest form because dissolution was for him a device to allow others in the school, in the experience of the school, to confront their own psychoanalytic experience, their own act, um, instead of identifying with Lacan as the father of the school. Francois Dolto even wrote him a letter. He says this in April uh, of 1980, uh, that how could you do this? I paraphrase. How could you do this, Lacan? You are the school. Lacan said, there's one problem with my school. I am the one to dissolve it. So he moved from my school, object of the sentence, to I am dissolving it, subject of the sentence. And what he did through his dissolution as a sociological principle was immediately he built a new school. He reaffirmed what was always at the center in his founding act, namely the cartel. The cartel is a space where you have a social formation that is temporary, that doesn't have a father, but has a plus one who uh, asks questions and produces a whirlwind of knowledge and constantly disrupts the problematic group effects, whether they be vertical or horizontal effects of transference, in order to push and allow people to face psychoanalytic experience as an experience of transference to work, to psychoanalytic work, which Lacan had always maintained was at the center from the founding act through the proposition to the dissolution. And so I think in all of this, we can say that by facing up to the act, he's not, he's not calling for a return to fathers. He's not calling for us to be friends or comrades or peers or siblings. He's calling for us uh, to face our symptom, and I'll shut up in a moment, on both sides. The symptom that can be interpreted in a world, in a common discourse, and the part of the symptom that cannot be interpreted, that is singular, that is on the side of jouissance, that cannot be relinquished, but by trimming it down, the school will not prohibit that enjoyment, but will say, yes, we accept that enjoyment in the school. Uh, and I think it's... Uh, in, uh, on this point, Lacan's the sociologist par excellence. I think that was fantastic. fantastic. It's a great exposition of, of what the late Lacan as such is about. It's uh, you cannot talk about the late Lacan or the very the very late Lacan. We talk, you know, there's a lot of work, you know, that you find out oh, the late Lacan and it's sort of situated around questions of the drive. Okay. We talk about the drive a lot, you know, it's uh, but the really you know, truly late Lacan. Like if you go, in, it's a question. It's about questions, as Dwayne just pointed out. It's questions of the school. It's a central question of the school, and the school is inherently difficult. It's inherently difficult because uh, of its uh, its its radical nature. Uh, how it it's fragmented. I mean, like the you know the point the point is is that you know if you're taking Lacan into all these you know various theories, sociology, theology, 
all these different things. There's a way of framing it in a discourse. There's a way of framing it in a social world, right? But how do you frame the school as a political discourse? It's incredibly difficult, precisely because it's one by one by one by one. And it's a, it's in a constant process of, of dissolution. And, you know, for me, you know, that, and that the knowledge that comes from it isn't highly formalizable. You know, it doesn't come out in, you know, nice categories or nosological categories and segmentations and beautiful casuistry. No. It's uh, it comes out in, you know, uh, singular points that, you know, you take from the materiality of a clinical analysis there and then, which can be taken. But ultimately, the knowledge that comes from it can offer a sort of orientation for something else. But you can't take it as a given absolute. I think I'm, I'm right in saying this. I could be wrong, but, you know, I think this is the general idea. Now, the thing is, is how does that, you know, for my my own discourse, mystical theology, philosophy uh, and philosophical theology, is that you only have to look at, uh, you know, uh, I mean, who is that? Uh, there's a famous quote that's misattributed to Lacan. He says that the analyst is the monk in the desert. You know, you must have heard, I think Rosen says this. And Lacan, he didn't say it. It was actually Michel, Michel Gossatieu that said it, his uh, Jesuit uh, his Jesuit student. And it's a misattribution to, uh, to Lacan, but he said that Lacan is like an analyst. It was like a, a monk going into the desert. And the more, you know, as Dwayne, I've always thought, what's this mean? You know, you like to sort of uh, romanticize the, uh, the analyst, you know, sat there quiet like a monk, you know, it's, that's sort of, cliche i think it's got a lot more to do with what Dwayne's talking about the school you know if you go back into the early early church third fourth century these are uh, the, de the desert hermits the guys just wandered out into the desert and they stayed there they were isolated they were on their own you know and uh they they faced incredibly harsh environments and they had to engage in assesses training not learning, not learning, training, physical training, because if they didn't, they'd die. You know, they would die in the desert. And eventually, in this isolation, communities formulated over them. But then, you know, people like Anthony of the desert, they got fed up with people around them. And so then they dissolved and went out further into the desert. <laughs> and again, the same thing happens again and again. But the, what, what comes from them? Is a, is a collection of sayings, you know, various things that aren't highly formulated. They're not, it's not the high learning of the city. It's not like, you know, John Cassian, and, you know, and, um, or it's, it's, it's not like uh, the Cappadocian fathers or all this, you know, nice systematic theology. What you have is a living, breathing practice uh, where, you know, you might get small you know snippets of information that will work in one situation but not in another i think that there's something there you know i think that there's a there's something in regards to that well, about uh, if you look at the late lacan the very late lacan and the question of the school and how the, the school is a place of what you call non-knowledge as well right call it non-knowledge if i remember and that specifically that comes from nicholas of cusa that comes from Nicholas of Cusa, the Doctrina Ignorantia, it's called. Uh, ig uh, a wise unknowing, or wise knowing, I don't. Um, it's, it's a question of that the school is a place where in our approach to the symptom, what is produced is not, you know, a solid knowledge that can be passed on like a coin, <laughs> but it's something of a non-knowledge that can be utilised. Uh, and I think, you know, that there's something there in relation to uh, mystical the mystical theology, not as a, you know, experientialist or, you know, you know, a strange esoteric doctrine, but as a structure, a structure of how knowledge can be passed on. All right. So what I'm what I'm what I'm taking away from this is. Focusing on, again, this wow factor, you know, being wowed by the father, being wowed by the brothers and the siblings. I'm shifting it more to thinking that the wow factor is related to the school. Um, and that this wow factor related to the school is not, not a father, but a 
some there has to be some sort of plus one. And what I want to connect it to is potentially, let's see if there's a connection here, is Freud's idea that there's three impossible professions. The government, the education, and analysis as, as impossible professions. And is this somehow related to the idea of the school that Lacan was was working towards, you know, and also maybe the stakes also of holding a conversation that involved the Lacanian clinicians and the Lacanian theorists? And maybe if it's not sort of pressing too far, if there's any relationship between the, the school and the family. So there's a lot there. If I could frame the question sort of succinctly, and maybe we'll start with Dwayne and then go to Mark, is sort of focusing on the wow factor of the school. Is it related to the impossible professions or the link between the impossible professions of government education and analysis? And then is there any way or connection between the school and the family or what is the relationship between the school and the family, if at all? Great question. Uh, I, I have a feeling you might have a better answer than I could give, but uh, I think that um, when we're talking about politics as an impossible profession, but politics, uh, uh, I think it, it always comes with a question of mastery. Uh, in one way or another. Uh, this is also true of teaching. Uh, I think what Lacan had done and what I'm hearing and what you're saying is uh, he grounded the school with the cartel as its as its you know uh, fundamental organ uh, as a social formation that would not succumb to mastery, ideally, uh, and so would be anti-political. I, I, I admit that this is my reading. Uh, I happened, be, before I got into psychoanalysis, I was involved in uh, a, a particular obscure branch of anarchist theorizing and practice known as anti-politics, anti nihilist anarchism, and so on, post-left anarchism, mostly out of the West Coast, California. Um, nor would the school uh, occupy the place of, the, uh, of, of a type of teaching that had been done in the IPA preceding it. Because in the IPA, there was, let's say, clearly two rivers. All of this, by the way, is already addressed in a way that's way more clear than anything I could ever say by Jacques Alain Miller in his 1989-19 course, 1990 course, The Analyst Banquet. Uh, but there was basically two, two pathways, pure psychoanalysis, um, psychoanalytic experience, psychoanalysis as therapy, let's say, to put it very simply, or um, the teaching analysis, the didactic analysis. Lacan didn't want to return to the model of teaching that had been uh, corrupting and producing an initiatory society within the IPA. He was excommunicated from that, precisely on the question of teaching. For Lacan, teaching, and for Freud, read it in his question on, uh, on lay analysis, it comes from psychoanalytic experience. This is the cutting edge. This is the best lesson you could ever get in psychoanalysis is to go through psychoanalysis yourself. That might sound a little mystical. Maybe Mark and I might have some agreement, some disagreement on this question, but this is the best teaching you could have. For Freud, he added some other ingredients. Freud added, well, you should also be very much acquainted with the culture of your time. You know, basically you should know the language very well. You should know what's ha happening in culture and these sorts of things as well. Um, so he wanted to restore that. The question is, how can you do that? How can you uh, switch tracks from the transference that begins 
at the end of a preliminary session in the clinic, which is the transference to your analyst, and shift it to a transference to psychoanalysis, to the work. Um, and Lacan's answer was the cartel. You know, when I didn't finish the story because I talked too long, I either don't talk enough or I talk too long, this is my problem. Uh, when Lacan dissolved his school, immediately he already founded another school, right? Uh, he founded the Ecole de la Cause Freudian, uh, the ECF, immediately. And he said it like that. He said, right away, I, I founded this other school. So the idea of dissolving the school was to highlight, again, this is perhaps I'm reading too much, the fact that you have all these cartels, what Lacan called, he said, I have a pile of people who want me to take them. I will not make a hole out of them, he said. He, he wanted to send them all back to their own lonely experience in relation to psychoanalytic work and the psychoanalytic experience. And he wanted somehow to restore that to the dignity of the dominant principle of the school. So the school wasn't a place to institutionalize psychoanalysis, to petrify the sort of knowledge and innovations that come out of our own psychoanalytic experience. He didn't want petri uh, petrifaction of knowledge, nor ossification. Uh, he wanted to promote the desire to know. He said, you can know. Um, and he wanted that to be through the teaching that one encounters with an analyst who has also had the experience. So it's not a teaching that is a one-size-fits-all theory or technique for all. This is what makes it so difficult. I'm reminded of, since we have two people who are interested in theology a little bit, or more or less, uh, I'm reminded of a story of uh, the Buddha, who, uh, I'll, I'll shut up after this, who, uh, you know, he was always in a sort of feud with his, brother I believe his brother was very jealous of him because Buddha was a sort of prized and uh, protected uh, child uh, and Buddha was sitting outside of the uh, the village uh, and people were coming up to him and asking him questions and his brother was hiding behind the tree listening the man came up to Buddha one man and he said he asked the question Buddha gave a response and then another person came and asked the exact same question Buddha gave a different response and the man came from behind the tree and said, aha, I caught you. You know, you're inconsistent. We very much value consistency, both in the university and, and in political discourse, for some reason, despite the fact that the world is pragmatic. Um, Buddha said, I told each what they needed to hear. Um, so when we're in these venues and we're trying to present a theory, a theory that seems to be the same at time one, time two, time three, in some sense, this goes against what the cartel was designed for. Exactly. Uh, and, you know, it's even a little dishonest, I would say, for Mark and I to come here and represent the book, because the book is at war with itself. Uh, that was Bataille's expression, Bataille, a close friend of uh, Lacan for a while there. Um, the, we have all kinds of people in the book who have their own points of view that are quite different from mine, quite different from Marx, quite different from each other. Uh, and so they would even answer this different. And I think that was important in the book to, to have people that are within the school, outside of the school, um, in different fields, in the clinic, outside of the clinic, with different positions on the notion of negativity and positivity, but nonetheless, in one way or another, sort of uh, interested in the Freudian field. Uh, sorry, I am talking way too much today. Forgive me. No, it's it's, it's uh, I think that's you know, uh You're you're here to talk, Dwayne. So there's no no need to apologize. Uh, I'm quite quite appreciative. Uh, yeah, but but go on for you, Mark. You know, the question of the one by one. I mean, what we have, you know, with uh, you you go back to like seminar twenty, and then he makes the distinction between the all and the not all, and the all is. Uh, the world of segmentate, segmentation, uh, first principles, categories, uh, modernity. And then we have, you know, uh, the not all, which Lacan associates with the mystical, um, other jouissance. But, you know, 
it, it th this becomes uh, the not all is what you know evolves into these various aspects that come later in his in his teachings, whether from you know the question of the synthome, uh, la langua, uh, and then you know be, you know the idea of the school, the school as instantiation of the not all, uh, insofar that the cartel is singular, one by one by one by one, and it becomes incredibly difficult to speak. It becomes incredible, incredibly difficult uh, to to mediate because the type of knowledge that comes from it is, as, as Dwayne points out, it's singular. And so, yes, there is this problem of, of the book itself. Yes, it's got a broad, broad question of question of negativity, uh, the place of negativity. But in terms of how each person is is relating that question, it's very much related to the specificity of the field of you know the context and what they're writing about um so there is always a danger of mis misrepresenting but again and i think Dwayne put it beautifully there is it's at war with itself or you know another way of saying it, it's it's a unity in difference maybe it's um it's it's a way of um yeah uh there's a knowledge there but um it invites work <laughs> um but there was something else on the tip of my tongue um but it's gone Maybe uh, you ask ask a, a question, spur me. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it'll it'll come as soon as I start talking. I'm sure. I mean, I, it seems to me like what you're saying, Mark. This relationship between, let's say, the category of the one and modernity and the narrative, and, and that breaking down with po post modernity, and we could say that that breaking down into the not all. Um, you know, and then there's sort of a mystical, there's another jouissance there. And that sort of brings us back to to the original sort of, I think, structural question, which I find so fascinating between the Boromean knot, which can be held together by the name of the father and the saturation of jouissance, which opens up a not all, which cannot be totalized, which is sort of opening into sort of a mystical, ineffable jouissance. Uh, perhaps opening up the conditions of possibility for something like a cartel, like you guys are saying, cartel. And now, you know, when I when I associate just off my sort of intuition on on what is a cartel, well, you hear about drug cartels, you hear about organized crime. I mean, uh, you know, this this type of school, you know, uh, analytic knowledge is the criminal focus. analysts, uh, criminal uh, analysts. So, you know, is this <laughs> is, is psychoanalysis a type of organized crime? Is it selling the drug of the impossibility of self-knowing and this singular jouissance, crime, this crime singular differentiation? You know, it's a, um, you know, but but it, the drug here would be, it sounds like this singular differentiation and this sort of uh impossible to interpret jouissance which we have to accept and make room for and you know so forth and so on um and then again sort of i want to bring this back around to okay we're here in this incredibly complex social uh mm. configuration and then theologically sociologically whatever direction you guys want to take it are we abandoning the entire project of the name of the father in relationship to this sort of non-all and this this saturation uh, point in which we sort of accept the singular differentiation and the impossible jouissance? These are some of the things going in my mind. I'm not sure if that's a clear question, but it's sort of what well, is on the frontier of my cognition. I can only answer from, you know, my, from my perspective, but I think, you know, in relation, uh, I mean, Dwayne probably give uh, you know, a question, a more clinical orientated answer, but in questions of, you know, uh, relating the, the psychoanalysis as uh, a, a fecund field uh, in relation to, to uh, you know, a toolbox for, you know, theology is that you know the question of the paternal signifier the question of father the nom de pure is that even that at the level of mystical theology comes undone it's always been undone it's always been there you know, meister eckhart what was the famous expression that he said god free me from god you know it's this you know the idea that uh, even god as a father you know the very term that we use father is a predicate and it's a predicate that can be uh, dispensed with in terms of when we're talking about the negative process of negative theology. Um, it's it's these terms can be um, negated. But even then, it's like um, I, I remember you saying, Dwayne. I remember we had a conversation about the question of the father 
and theology regarding in, in Islam. It's like it, it, God isn't presented as a father either. Is that right? No, no, you because that would make God uh, biological. And God in Islam is neither uh, male nor female nor uh, father. Uh, much of Islam is uh, a, a literal scripture. Whereas, of course, the Bible has metaphor, <laughs> a lot of metaphor. And um, and the, um, well, I think you're frozen. Oh, no, you're not frozen. I was. I'm just very um, slow. So we can you're, have you're coming, you're coming through as well, Dwayne. Your, your, okay. your internet connection okay. is coming through. Okay, good, good. Uh, so we can see in Islam another way to organize oneself socially. It's not a question of, uh, let's say, does foreclosure of the non the power imply that the father is not there? No, the father just shifts into another register into the yep. real. It's yep. a question of which register is the father, right? And so I think you don't dispense with the father necessarily, but the symptom is also a non the power. And it's a question of making it so. You know, this what Lacan said um, when he dissolved his school was, um, as with my Baromian knot, you take one away and the whole thing falls apart. He was referring to himself because he had disidentified himself with the school, he had collapsed the school, and the Baromian knot came undone. Yet, immediately upon doing that, he, he's forming a new school based on what? Uh, based on the centum, Jewessence, the new paradigm of Jewessence that he had founded in the 1970s and into the 1980s, the centum can also be a fourth ring that can hold together uh, uh, a Baromian knot. And you can call that the nom de pair if you like. It's an anchoring principle. In fact, Lacan did call it a nom de pair at one time. Um, so th that's, uh, that's uh, one thing. But the other thing is, of course, that their Islam is an example of a social bond that is not edible. We can find examples uh, Dr. Bose in India was trying to convince Freud at the time, he was a correspondent of Freud, that in India there was another social formation that uh, he called the Ganesha complex um, that began in the field of the other. Um, uh, and uh, you know how in the Oedipus complex, to put it really simply, you basically have like uh, a child in rivalry with the father because he wants to fuck the mother. This is the basic like Oedipal way to read it, you know, because the father's the obstacle, the non the pair is stealing you, your, uh, your, your jouissance, your oneness with the mother, right? And so your fusion uh, has been disrupted, you're separated, and now you're angry, you have a desire to fuck the mom again, except a substitution for the mom, of course. In, in, uh, in India, uh, it's been long known that uh, it begins with the child as frustrating the union of the father and the mother. And so what do they do? They cut the head off of the uh, the child, put an elephant head on. You know, the child is the problem. Uh, so you, you can have, so I think this is the importance of the clinic. If we create a theory, a one-size-fits-all theory that I think we often find in a lot of uh, Lacanian philosophy, but not always, but it is there. We can't deny it. It's also there in, in the Lacanian clinic as well. Um, we can miss what's unique to different social formations, not only within our own cultures, but in other cultures. You know, that's why the one by one is is uh, is so important. No, no, I agree. I, can, I, 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 and I think what was uh, what's interesting today. Uh, you now, going back to the question of um, the the, the non-rapport, um, which is the, the the theoretical basis from which all this you know came on later on is that we live in an era, I think, and I, I'm just going off pure vibes here, pure intuition, all right, is that we live in an era where we think everything is possible, where we think we, we are in, to talk about uh, a field of saturation, a field of saturation and saturation of jouissance is also to talk about a dream of the dream of the possible. Everything is possible because, you know, everything is instant, everything is passed to us. But it's precisely because we think that we're in this era of absolute possibility. Everything is quantifiable. Everything is, can be systematized. AI can do everything, you know, and we've got this imaginary idea of 
uh, you know, some uh, teleological utopia just around the corner and everything could be fine where everything is possible because of this saturated culture of immediacy. And because we think everything is possible, everything becomes impossible, uh, everything begins to fall apart. Lacan is very clear that, you know, what's at the heart of communication? What's at the heart of love, Dwayne, is, is failure, right? And so it's, it's, it's failure itself that is at the root of the social bond. But because when we are willing to look at failure or willing to be able to countenance it or willing to be able to really deal with impossibility, whatever you want to call it, everything uh, falls apart. And I think what, what's interesting when I'm reading Miller, especially in his Paradigms of Jouissance, is that, yes, you have the not all of the clinic, uh, the one by one of the clinic. But there's also, you know, if you're reading some of the um, the analysts, you know, some of the, there's some, some great work, I forget, I mean, Natalie something. Um, she, she, yeah, she, she talks about the uh, the era where the era that we're in the capitalist discourse of the era of saturation it is again not all so you've got two two realities the not all of the clinic uh, mm -hmm. versus or ha as a as a interruption to this not all of of capitalism it's you know offering a, a type of discourse of minimal difference between the two and so you know that's a that's an interesting question for me is how can this not all deal or interrupt this not all? How can this, um, I, I think it's got something to do with interfering or making a break into, you know, this not all is one which cannot deal with impossibility, right? I, I think it cannot deal with impossibility and because it cannot deal with impossibility, it, it labors under the illusion of instantaneous communication or fusion, whatever you want to call it. Um, and because of that, it all falls apart and it leads to uh, isolation, uh, the imposition of the iron order of, of the social and the frater and the endless fraternities, the segmented, uh, sorry, segregated, that's the right term, segregated language games that works by affirmation and works by, you know, putatively creating an endless list of enemies. Um, sorry, I was rattling on. Anyone else? No, that's... That's what I see. You know what I think? Uh, I think um, uh, Lacan's Borromean knot was for him all in some sense. So it was not all. <laughs> and he moved toward with the centum, not all. Um, why? Because in his later period of Jewissance, the one taken one by one sounds a lot like addictions. And a lot of people today, of course, are suffering from addiction. The drug that Cadell, uh, you, you were talking about a moment ago, the drug of the one by one. And the Lacanian clinic wants to work at, with, with Jewissance, just as much as it wants to work with symbolic language. The Chomskyan device is innate, linguistic acquisition device governed by syntactical structures, this sort of stuff. Just as much as we want to work Organ. in that domain, we also want to work in the domain of Jouissance. But here, I would make a distinction between the saturation of Jouissance and the opacity of Jouissance. The saturation of Jouissance is the problem. This is a problem that we suffer from. The opacity of Jouissance is the Jouissance that um, let's say, can be scaled down and isolated. And we have tools for that. So Freud outlined the tools to deal with uh, language understood in its common sense. You know, he, he talked about condensation, displacement. He outlined some tools for, let's say, analytic interpretation. Um, and we know many of them. Um, if you've read Bruce Fink's book, uh, they're all in there. <laughs> But Lacan also outlined in his later teaching a way to counteract the repetition of the one by one. And here repetition should be distinguished from what some philosophers call dialectics. 
there is repetition of the one of jouissance uh, along the circuit of the drive, as is in a Taurus, which is the cover of our book. And Cyrus St. Damon Polyakov has a fantastic chapter in the book on spiraling in the Taurus. Um, and there's dialectics uh, and in all of its various incarnations, because there's many ways to think about dialectics, not just the Hegelian, of course, there's the Western Marxists and so on and so on. And there's a great Russian theorist uh, who I met recently who outlines uh, his version of negative dialectics and negative revolution and this sort of stuff. Uh, so repetition is about what can never be brought into a dialectical movement or processes. What within a culture will never be a Napoleon for Hegel? What doesn't give the marching orders? What doesn't work, but from which we obtain a significant amount of jouissance? And it repeats. So every drink is a, one drink, right? And there's a stubbornness to this jouissance, an incredible stubbornness that the, the one who suffers in the clinic, just as much as the one who suffers in war, whether it's Vladimir Putin and Russia or whatever you want to name, America, we have our stubbornness too. Lacan called it in his early teaching in the Acree, the C factor of any culture. It's what can never be brought into a di uh, dialectic, can never be relinquished, but it can be isolated. And the tool that Lacan outlined was the equivocation. Through the equivocation, you can separate enjoyment, jouissance, from its meaning. Uh, you can separate the coupling of what Lacan called S1 and S2. And you can take the jouissance in its opacity, in its, if you like, singularity, all alone, and face it, which is quite different from taking a pill that keeps you going in, uh, and going and going and going, this sort of thing. So I think this is one of the incredible um, innovations of the Lacanian orientation in its last teaching. It rises up to the suffering of the time and uh, and in a way that the early and middle Lacan, I'm not sure is quite capable of doing, unless you read the late Lacan, go back and read the first and middle period. Well, it's, it's, it's that, you know, what's, you know, it, it, it's, um, how can I, I have a general tend that I can, you know, see connections or movements in other fields and what, and what you said there about the idea of we're moving away from, you know, questions of dialect questions of dialectic in you know that's a myriad phrase we're not just talking you know Marx we're talking the, the idea there is many theorists that fall under uh, a type of imminentist logic of of dialectic of segmentation first principle um and um casuistry interpretation heuristics and we're moving away from that and uh, uh, what you said uh, and uh, you know the idea of spiraling uh, the idea of a type of oscillation uh, whereby we can separate these things and be able to, with that separation, find a way of being able to encounter this jouissance. I was going to ask you, I mean, we, we're seeing this already in, in, in certain sociological theories um, where questions of oscillation, and very much not in a Lacanian parlance, you know, but we can see that there's also, it, like the question of metamodernism meta that is all about this question of of giving up the dialectic it's you know this idea of moving on like this but this idea of oscillation of moving back and forth a world where we can have a type of uh you know recognize our investment in, in certain signifiers and where we, where we can be earnest you know we can be hopeful but then at the same time realizing it's not absolute and then move back into a type of critical distance so that oscillation happens all the time. Now that obviously to me is, you know, that comes, it's a you know, new field. Uh, but, you know, to me, that that question of 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 uh, oscillation, it's related directly to the question of the analogia entis. The idea of, uh, well, you know, if you're reading like you know, more early 20th century theologians like Klisvara, he was said from the very beginning he's against questions of dialectic you know the questions of dialectic and, and hegel because it leads to a problem of dissolution but what he wants to see is a type of um unity and difference and oscillation within the structure and it's only in that oscillation that we can 
you know, have a semblance of knowledge, a knowledge that isn't absolute, that we can't uh, get a, an entire grip on, but at least we can say something about it. Um, I just, you know, that's all I, I wanted to say. <laughs> you know, For courses exploring the foundation of modern philosophy, as well as live events bringing philosophy to life, visit philosophyportal.online and become a member today. Throughout 2024, our members get access to four monthly events. In March, we focus on the concept of the sacred and welcome guests Andrew Davis, Ruth E. Kastner, and Matthew Segal. Find out more at philosophyportal.online. You know, the, the interesting thing for me uh, in sort of, I guess, my intellectual positionality is that, I mean, I, I really learned hegel backwards from my inspiration from from zizek primarily like reading less than nothing mostly and and that was sort of where you know he endlessly repeats that absolute knowing is is not like a gripping or it's not like a fullness but it's more like a defecation like it's more like a letting go like he always critiques this you know eating process like adorno's dialectic of hegel is this sort of like Hegel's this monster that eats everything and consumes everything into himself and sort of always emphasize no don't don't forget to to take a shit so to speak don't forget to let go um and and that sort of 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 influenced me a lot um what I see is what's coming out of my work spontaneously in terms of the discourse that I see emerging is that it's this sort of let's say affirmation of of a dark ages or a dark renaissance like that we're heading into a dark ages and 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 that it's primarily we're heading into a dark ages because of what you guys have been talking about that we currently live in an age where we think everything is possible and when we think everything is possible nothing becomes possible um and it, and it has to do with this inability to confront the impossibility at the core of the social bond um and what I see here is the need to defecate. Mm -hmm. What I see here is the need to empty out um, that that we need to like, you know, I, I had a discussion with a friend at, at Voicecraft. Um, his name is Tim Adlin. It's a great name for his project, by the way, Voicecraft. I, I think it's it's a great a great idea is, you know, he's saying, you know, the world is just shit right now. And I said, well, yeah, well, maybe maybe, you know, maybe we need to keep shitting. You're like, maybe we need to keep emptying out, you know, like maybe we need to confront the social impossibility at the core of our culture in order to question of kenosis there as well. Right. right. Well, that, 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 that is what I sort of take to be knowing. What, what is, what is definitely, what is shit? Shit in psychoanalysis. Well, Freud linked it with money for reasons that we might want to explore later. But well, maybe we can explore it and I'll come back to it in a moment. I won't talk too yeah, long. Yeah, that would be, but, I would like that, by the way. That would be good. But shit is an object. And it's an object of, let's say, excess. Yeah. Uh, when Lacan defined madness, whether it's psychosis or otherwise, but let's say psychosis, uh, the psychotic carries their object in their pocket. I think that's how he put it. And we have seen cases in the clinic, anybody who's worked in the clinic, or you might even know about the severe cases of psychoses, where people do not poop in the toilet or outside. They put it in their hands. They make art with it. Mm -hmm. Is that sublimation? They write on the walls with it. They can't let go of their objects. Uh, and, you know, I've seen it not just with that particular object, which is shit, but with other objects as well. Uh, whatever the object is, and there's many numbers, uh, any number of objects. When we talk about modernity, and what modernity introduced against the feudal farm, it was lack. It was... Uh, an object that would be taken from you, yep. giving rise to value, money, exchange economy, and so on. When we talk about Russia, and when I say we, I mean not we, but the leaders of Russia. You can go Google this if you like. Margaret Thatcher said the same thing about Russia many, many years ago. 
Russia has everything that it needs. Key word is need, which is key in psychoanalysis. It has rich resources, wonderful trees, oil, gas, uh, deep textured culture. Russia doesn't need anything. It carries its object in its pocket. I wouldn't say we don't carry our objects in our pocket because we're all, uh, we all have something of, of this in us. But um, I think this is important. Because when it comes to trade networks, we're going to try and attack Russia uh, by uh, by um, targeting the trade their, their trade networks, their banks, and so on. It didn't phase Russia. Let's be honest. It didn't phase Russia. Their economy is fine. It's our economy that sucks. We're in a housing crisis. Uh, in my hometown. Okay. Yeah, in, in the UK, I mean, Ireland, I, I went to Ireland as a refugee, we couldn't find housing. Uh, and in my hometown, which I visited not so long ago of Canada, a loaf of bread, you want to talk about give us this day our daily bread, a loaf of bread for Canadian dollars, and that's for the no name bread. It's ridiculous. Um, so uh, there, there's something here about uh, about not generalizing um, the idea of, uh, of um, whether or not somebody has an object or doesn't have an object. Do you know what I would just, the, you know, what you're saying there about, you know, having the object in a pocket, the idea of, you know, we have these other economies, you know, uh, the putative other Russia, uh, and they produce, they keep it in their pocket. Uh, Anna Kornberg's book talks about the, the the style of Western late capitalism, where nothing is produced, nothing's produced. There is no shit, right? There's no shit. We don't shit anymore. We're all, but what we do is we circulate this endless circulation of what's out there. So it's this endless circulation, but no production. And uh, and what happens is this speed of you know. And when she's talking about this endless circulation, she's talking about the the attention economy she's talking about the the um the 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 screen economy the idea of we may become we circulate ourselves as products we become the shit you know it's uh so yeah i don't know it's just a thought it's it's, it's interesting because um uh in the west uh, we're seeing a lot more people uh, participating in what decades ago the anarchists called dropout culture they do not want to enter the economy for various reasons all of which seem to me to be perfectly justified they don't want to work uh, so the question of capitalism becomes really interesting because for marx you needed to pass through capitalism mm -hmm. it's fascinating that in some of the countries that max weber identified as not being modern i would disagree with them uh, this is where Marxism has taken hold, not in the capitalist countries. But um, Lacan said, I think in seminar five to seven, one of those seminars, uh, he intimated that we hadn't yet achieved capitalism, actually. And I think to some extent, we can see that uh, what we're experiencing in the West is not capitalism. It's the repetition, repetition of feudalism. Feudalism is part of the drive. It repeats, I mean, in some simplistic way. And we see lots of people who don't want to enter the economy, who are involved in all kinds of artistic productions at home, but they can't find value for their artistic production in a world. And so they don't feel like they have a world. And so in this way, these people, they seem to have everything they need. Uh, we can see that there's a bit of the Russian soul in all of us. And I think this is what Vladimir Putin was trying to say when, I, I've repeated it many times, when Biden was looking in his eyes, Biden said, uh, I see whatever. Uh, Vladimir Putin said, what you see is your own soul reflected back at you. There's something in what Freud called in his essay, the unheimlich, the uncanny, the unhomely, the double. Freud called it the double. There's something of the double in our relationship to uh, 
uh, to um, Russia, to India, to many countries, China, and so on, which isn't to say that these countries are innocent because they're not, but they partake in a different logic, it seems to me, one that we fail to recognize in ourselves, one that doesn't follow the, the Oedipal logic of the League of Nations, of NATO, of national sovereignty, of peace treaties and these sorts of ideas, uh, a, a different sort of logic uh, that they call the civilization state to be distinguished from the nation state, which is quite Oedipal and modern. So what we see and what we're confronting, I think in the West is uh, something that Lacan had foresaw in the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s, something he prophesized in a sense, uh, and something that we have a chance today, I think, to face up to. Can I can I jump in? I, I'd like to jump in here. So, on this issue of Russian politics that you're bringing up, and 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 that Russia has everything in it, you know, has its object in its pockets, so to speak. And you sort of link that to the psychotic state, madness. You know, Maybe not madness. Psychosis. We're all mad, but oh, it's mad. sure. I accept it. I accept it. You know what? What it's it sounds to me that you're pointing towards is, is in my own language, in my own conversation, is something that I saw as a type of separatist Duganism, where there's sort of like there's there's this tendency to a pre-modern um, state of mind, or what maybe we call a pre-modern state of mind. I would see it as a symptom of what I'm pointing towards with the Dark Ages. Yes, um, yeah, that yeah. We're, we're we're heading towards uh, a situation you know, where where the, the ideology of set of let's say neoliberal capitalism that everything's connected and we're in a globalized economy and we're in a globalized world and we're all connected. This seems to be the opposite oscillation. This seems to Absolutely. be the oscillation towards separation, an oscillation towards creating very firm boundaries. It's something that 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 seems to me to be the revival of the ancient and the feudal and the pre-modern mind but into it's what's that question of the oscillation again you know this idea yeah. that if you look at uh you look at uh Duggan, he's not just a you know i'm no you know big i'm comes with all, all caveats of critique and whatnot but no we we look at Dugganism as you know a type of neo-feudalistic expression whereby you know you've got it's not just a, a pure fundamentalism and imaginary going back to the past you look at his work it's both you know heavily sociological it's it's to do with you know critique postmodernity but at the same time it oscillates back and goes back into you know uh, the byzantine fathers and you know orthodox christianity and mystical mysticism and hermeticism and then oscillates yeah. and then goes back into this sort of a uh, you know heavily sociological theoretical exposition it's that oscillation again not dialectic does that make sense? I don't know. You, uh, I, I, I really, I really love this discussion and, and the way both of you have just put it because I think there's something really significant in what you both just said. Personally, um, I think I had a conversation with Dugan a long time ago. He's a sociologist and he's very honest about what I mean. I'm not praising him, <laughs> but he, you know, he he honestly. My assessment of him is he honestly is interested in what he's saying. Uh, purely for the sake of the idea, capital I. He's a, he, he sees himself as a true philosopher, a true philosopher. What he calls for is a multipolar world, multipolarity. It's interesting. He calls, he, he, he makes gestures toward postmodernism, Jean-Francois Lyotard and, and this sort of stuff. Um, he seems to elevate, he seems to elevate some sort of notion of relativism. And he seems to imagine that he's up against uh, a father country that is anchoring the world together. Maybe a father that's severe, a, persever, a, a persevering father. Uh, and in some sense, these are the only two options that he imagines are on the table. The one world government or the, the, the government of multipolarity. And uh, I think what the modern period expected, if you read Kant, if you read Kant on how nations should relate to one another, particularly if a citizen of one country is in a, uh, a, another foreign country, how you relate to that citizen when he does something that's 
taboo within the new country and these sorts of things that Kant was talking about, um, you get the sense that um, this is a world that is very Oedipal that, he, that's he, that, that he's imagining. I think what Dugan is exposing is another, uh, uh, I wouldn't say a dark age, but a dark continent that we have to face. Uh, and, um, and I think that uh, what he's capitalizing on is what we're witnessing in many countries today, as you put it. I went to a global peace uh, uh, forum uh, not so long ago, and the idea was how do we build uh, peace with different countries by instituting different symbolic agreements, symbolic pacts. This is what Kant was also talking about in his Notes on a Perpetual Peace essay. He was talking about how when we're in times of war and we're displaced and so on, we can build these symbolic treaties. It was meant as a bit of a joke, but it's also a very serious document. Um, I think what Dugan and others, Prime Minister Modi, and so many other countries in the world are showing today is a temptation toward what Lacan called the C factor. Uh, something of their enjoyment as a culture that they refuse to relinquish. And if we don't start to develop measures to recognize the stubbornness of each one and to work with it, um, then uh, I think the war is just going to continue. All right. I think that this is, this is so here's, here's, I want to frame, I didn't expect the conversation to go in this direction and I'm, I'm I'm excited and I'm and I'm and I'm in some sense, you know, I'm glad the conversation has gone in this direction. It's it's been a fantastic discussion. Um and, and I do want to you know link it back to negativity and psychoanalysis eventually. But what I want to frame is is this question of need that you brought up, Dwayne, and and this, you know, unique situation that you sort of framed with Russia not not really needing. Um, let's say anything outside of itself and you can keep its object in its pocket, so to speak, like you're saying. So I'm going to frame something. When I was in my doctorate, I did deep readings of basically all of Zizek's main texts, but as a sort of exercise in opposition, I did a deep reading of uh, Peter Sloterdijk's Spheres trilogy. And here's here's the here's the, uh, the quote from Fomes, which is the last text in in, in Slaughter Dyke's Spheres trilogy, says, and I think this is deeply relevant to what we're talking about. He says, so the one orb has imploded. Now the foams are alive. So it's this, it's this movement from the one, let's say the one world government has imploded, and now the foams are alive. And and it's, you know, th I get this idea of, you know, this this maybe not dark age, but this dark continent that you're saying, Dwayne, is like, you know, we, we have to sort of really brace ourselves and start to think a multipolar world. And I'm just wondering if if this phrase um, has anything to do with the one by one. Anything to do, you know, with the stubborn enjoyment in the culture that you're t you're pointing towards, but also sort of to twist this around. One of the things that I have found interesting in in Zizek's later work is that he does have sort of an affirmative political project which he seems to call disaster communism and this idea of disaster communism seems to me to ask the question and I'll, I'll pose this to you Dwayne is the question it seems to me is do we need one another meaning meaning if there is some sort of semblance of a say a total project, it seems to me that it would have to be situated in negativity. Like, and I would give the example of, let's say like, and this is just sort of a symptom of maybe it's not even on that order yet, but with COVID-19, that's the example I always give with COVID-19, that was, that was a global negativity. You know, each government had to come up with their own reaction to it, but it was a global negativity. And the question to me is, do we need each other? And, and Russia sort of not needing any can isolate itself. Is will we encounter a negativity great enough in the 21st century that a global politics becomes, 
you know, as it were, in need of coordination. So I, I leave that there. I know there's a lot there, but but I mean, be interested to know what's coming to your mind there. I don't know. I, can I? Uh, uh, sorry, I let you. Yeah. Well, you know, I I woof in my typical Lacanian way, <laughs> and uh, sometimes. I'm surprised because it's not so typical, um, but uh, where does, let, let me begin psychoanalytically. Where does the symptom come from? It's, it's a question hopefully that'll lead toward something of a sociological answer. We'll see, inshallah. Um, for, for Freud, from the very beginning, but I'll point in 1899 to his dream book, we could already, already see that the father couldn't reach all of the enjoyment. There was always, always already within Freud's dream world, a part that the father couldn't regulate, couldn't prohibit. Freud called it the navel of the dream. He later would call it the hard rock of castration. So the father's reach, because it can't reach everyone or every part of the enjoyment, um, some spills out. And what we saw in American history, it spills out in the symptom. What we saw in American history was some spilling over the years. We saw, you can hear it in discourse, in the discourse of the American uh, presidential, well, all the, can't, all, all the politicians really. First, it was the rogue state. With the idea of the rogue state, you had a state within, let's say the League of Nations, United Nations, whatever else, that didn't exactly operate according to the rules. So it was a question of how to bring them back into alignment with the reach of the law that had been uh, developed within the sphere, the very Oedipal sphere of the League of Nations, the sphere. And uh, the rogue nation bubbled out and it became the evil empire, which is a bigger symptom. Uh, and then it became serious. I mean, I think this is a, basically a hot war. It was a cold war. I think this is a hot war. We can debate that. I think it's a hot war through pro by proxy, but it's a hot war. So it's precisely because the father doesn't have the reach that the symptom emerges. And we have to turn our attention to the symptom, from the father to the symptom. Um, so I think the father was never uh, the answer we hoped he would be maybe the father's still to come uh, in the way we manage our symptoms uh, but I think right now in, in geopolitics it's a time for um Rethinking uh, the Oedipal uh, dream and realizing that it's a dream we can still have. We still do have the Oedipal dream, but it's shifted into a new place and it's no longer in a place of primacy. Just as in the clinic, and I'll shut up after this, I promise this time, just as in the clinic, people used to come and deliver their dreams to us on a silver platter. Okay. Today, you hear from people that they're not dreaming. There are still dreams. They're just in a different place. You just have to see how they relate to artificial intelligence, to their, um, their Apple products. Uh, I don't know, MetaQuest 2 or 3 or whatever the Apple 
goggle thing that they have now, so on uh, Hollywood and so on, because these are dreams that we dream in public. So the dream is still there. It's just, we have to displace it from its place of primacy. We have to stop believing that it's the only dream to dream. The Western dream is not the only dream. Uh, yeah. So I'll, I'll stop there. No, no, I think that this is, this is a great, I got just a point when you, uh, uh, you know, UK, so the, 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 the terms that you use, Cadell, uh, we burst the one and then we have all the foam. That's what you said, Slaughterdike, is that correct? Yeah, that's from uh, Slaughter Dykes Foams trilogy. The the last one in the in the fo in the trilogy, the Foams book. Yeah, you know, that's a yeah, go ahead. So Rendell, you know, Dwayne you know, speaking about spheres and bubbles, and that's the world that we're in. That worlds that we're in, world, bubble worlds. Uh, you know, singularities can't reach out to the other, and it's to do with the the lack of dream. And I'll give you an example. I think, you know, you go back and watch you know disaster nineties films. Right, you remember the, the the what what's that one Armageddon? Right, do you remember this sort of Armageddon, uh, the film Armageddon with Scott Bruce Willis in? What's fast or even uh, the day after tomorrow? Right, what's fascinating about these films, about these disasters, is that the, the, you can feel the dream. The dream is there, right? The dream is not so much. Oh my God, there's a comet coming towards us. It's that once when we know that this comet's coming towards us. There is going to be this other, this uh, symbolic order, this uh, collectivity that comes in. We'll be all bind together. We see some secret aspect of the government fly into fly into fly into uh, existence. We're going to come together. We're going to implement Plan Thirty Three Four, and then everyone gets together and they put in place and send you know various things out into space to blow up the the. Uh, uh, the imminent disaster, you know, there is a politics, a dream of a political symbolic order that's there below the surface, that when disaster strikes, when real horror is there, it will surface and it will save us. And then after COVID-19 and stuff, we realize that isn't there. It's not there. There is no dream. There is no dream in the bubble, right? And I think more and more now we see, we're seeing precisely the horror or the symptoms that arise from realizing there is no dream that girdles or you know, holds together our politics. And that's precisely why we're so enamored with entertainment today, with entertainment. And we see it all the time. What's really interesting is that if you go on you know, various online forums and whatever, the, the, the entertainment as such plays the place of the dream and mm. interpretation. People aren't, they'll argue about the specific politics of a given cartoon show. And they'll argue about the politics forever about a given show, you know, whether it has been hotel or something. They'll go on and on and on and on and on as if it's a dream, right? It's endless. And it's like where politics should be playing out, you know, in the field of reality, if you wish. It doesn't. It gets played out on the screen. People are obsessed with the, you know, the politics of whatever Netflix show or, um, you know, the, 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 what, whatever's happening in, in a given reality, mm -hmm. because there is no dream. There is no dream anymore that's undergirding things. You know, it's almost like um, we've moved from the subject of the statement, as Lacan put it in his early work, subject of the statement, Oops, let's, that's classical Lacan, to uh, the, the speaking being of entertainment, and I like the word entertainment because at the beginning you enter the tain, and tain is of course that that oh yeah I would I wouldn't call it foam it's more like a film um, that separates the glass from the wood so that you can see yourself in the mirror. Uh, but you know what Freud it, I, I promise I'm not going to talk a long time this time. What Freud at one time in in Beyond the Pleasure Principle had begun to experiment with, and he was accepting it more and more in my reading, was the idea that there was, for, for many uh, of us, uh, a sort of primordial trauma, birth trauma. And it was through this primordial trauma that in some sense we've entered um, the world, language. Uh, today, uh, we wonder if, we have to face, we still have to face the trauma, the nightmare, 
before we can dream again. I think we have to face the nightmare, uh, which is the navel of our dream world, precisely so that we can go on dreaming. Uh, so if nobody's dreaming today, uh, everybody talks about how they're traumatized today. I happen to think, and I know it's controversial, but I do it um, to provoke, uh, that uh, in some sense, socially, we haven't been traumatized yet. Uh, in some sense, traumatization is the prerequisite for us to return to the dream world. No, no, I, I think that you know, there is definitely something today where we're seeing the language of trauma disguise trauma. Um, or you know uh, the possibility of uh, the trauma of entering a symbolic, and I think you know we can talk about the commodification of endless uh, you know uh, constructed uh, DSM five symptomologies that are passed out that are given in place of a uh, you know the possibility of being able to talk about real trauma in a way that you know it's something that's always been interesting to me as a question: How can we talk about trauma without the unconscious? Right. It's a it's a wider question and something that I think that's really pertinent and should be discussed. But I I I think, you know, the world of, you know, we talk about the metaverse, we talk about, you know, pro, the provision, the, the the virtual reality. But it's not it's not just that. It's the the imposition of a type of endlessly streamed Hollywood reality that's beamed into us every given second. And for me. I find it fa fascinating where the field of politics as such, especially in you know American politics, is it becomes locked at that level of just cultural interpretation and endless dissemination and endless interpretation of a given you know uh, phenomenon in entertainment. That's where politics is happening. You know, it's it's and that to me, I think myself personally, I think that that comes from the inability to dream. It's 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 a wish to dream. You know, it's a wish to be able to construct a world. You know, it's, uh, and, and I think we need to be, you know, it's, I just find it fascinating, you know, uh, but, you know, it's something I need to think about a little bit more in regards to that. Um, well, yeah. Well, I'm just gonna, just gonna say, you know, one of the, the sort of the center, central pieces of the discussion that I've tried to, to track here is again, this relationship between the name of the father and sort of this excess syndrome, which comes out of the later Lacan's work, which Dwayne, you did such a good job articulating. And then again, you sort of said here, we have to move from, from the father to the symptom. And, you know, what came to my mind immediately was, was the following question. Is Jesus the symptom of God? You know, moving from the father to the symptom, you know, moving from the father, God to the son, Jesus. And then I was also thinking about the way you were playing with the Oedipal triangle. You know, when we usually articulate the Oedipal triangle, we think about it from the perspective of the child and the father is the obstacle. But you were articulating, we can also see it from the perspective of the father and the child is the obstacle. This is where we are today. Right, exactly. And then, but what if we are, what if we articulate it from the mother's perspective? And, and what, 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 what would that look like? You mm -hmm. know, and I was just thinking about so that then you could think about the father, the child and the mother. Maybe you could also think about God, Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Yes, except, except that um, when you say a symptom of God, um, the symptom spelled S-Y-M-P-T-O-N is the classical symptom that we know that comes as a consequence of the, uh, let's say, uh, difficult acceptance of the nom de pair. You don't fully accept it, you're neurotic, now you have symptoms. Symptoms that are lodged in the body or something like this. Symptoms, I mean, gadgets are symptoms too for Freud, right? He said it in Civilization and its discontents. Um, man has become a prosthetic god, you know, in this sense. Well, you know, this is why I think we have to be really attentive uh, to what's speaking in front of us. Uh, because a Muslim would never say this, for example. A Hindu wouldn't necessarily say that uh, Jesus is a symptom. 
um, you know, for a Muslim, Jesus is, of course, one of a lineage of prophets, the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, being the last one. Um, uh, peace be upon them, I should say, to be correct. <laughs> and um, for, let's say, Muslims, Jesus is, or sorry, God is not lacking. God is not a principle of constitutive lack. Uh, God is, uh, uh, you know, I'll give, I'll, I'll give you the example in another way. Mark, forgive me if I've said this to you before. And it's really simplistic, okay? But one of the ways I've thought about the Abrahamic religions, and we can talk about some of the other religions as well, is how they deal with the real of non-belief, let's say. Mm -hmm. Atheism, non-knowledge, as Mark put it earlier. Uh, and what type of God they have. And uh, each, each one kind of moves things around a little bit. For example, of course, uh, in Judaism, you have a God who prohibits. Uh, you get the, the tablet of the law. Um, so you have the rules. Of course, I've heard from some of my Jewish friends, maybe it's wrong, that these rules were already implicit in the, in the society, but they were repressed. You get the principle of repression. Um, and um, what type of God is it? It's a God of the law who inscribes the law upon tablets. Uh, in Christianity, you get um, the God of the body introduced. Jesus is God in the flesh, depending upon the interpretation, because there are Christians who don't believe that. Um, and you get a sort of perverse relationship to the law. Uh, in Judaism, you're allowed to be an atheist if you were a Jew at the beginning. And you can go to the synagogue, as many Jews do, uh, who are atheists. And you're still accepted within the community of Jews. In Christianity, so temporarily, you get atheism at the, at the end. In Christianity, you get a sort of perverse belief structure, uh, a God of the flesh, of the body, uh, so a God of the image. Judaism and Islam are both anti, let's say, idolatry. Um, and you get... Um, you get non-belief in the middle. So you can believe and then you can fall from belief. And there's many narratives of this, including in Jesus himself when he's upon the cross, as Zizek and Chesterton point out. And then a resurrection of belief. God comes out of the cave. And it's interesting how caves are dealt with in each of them too, each of the Abrahamic religions. And deserts, we mentioned deserts earlier. Desert is in a structurally different place. It's quite miraculous. Um, so... Judaism, atheism at the end, Christianity, atheism in the middle, uh, God of repression and the law in Judaism, God of perversion and so on, uh, and the image in, in Christianity. In Islam, you get a God of the real. God is in you more than your jugular vein. Um, God writes uh, scripture into nature itself. Um, and you have the Ummah, you have the Holy Spirit, and so on. Okay, so we have different ways of dealing with the symbolic, imaginary, and real. What threads them together is an emphasis on the symptom, in a sense. The symptom, which is the, the symptom uh, that is without meaning, that cannot be interpreted. The symptom as, uh, as uh, jouissance, uh, lodged in the body. So my point is just that to say that Jesus is the symptom of God could be one interpretation. Mm -hmm. But I think for me, I would say uh, it's not the only one. No, I agree. I agree. I, quite, I like uh, the exposition that you said about Islam, um, that world is scripture. You know, the idea that that's, that's part of uh, the Christian tradition as well. It's underlined a bit because of the Protestant Reformation. And whatnot, but you um, you read uh, the early patristics, and uh, they saw uh, a direct, especially with like people like pseudo Dionysus and the relationship between Augustine and how they read um, the interpretation of scripture and the literal meaning of scripture was related to the the the, the signum of, of of reality as being written by God. So there was this interrelation between the word as scripture 
and the written word of nature. And there was that. But I want to talk about the symptom that is Jesus, uh, Cadell, because that was a really interesting point. Because one of the things that you know you get from you know you've got that sort of vulgar conception of psychoanalysis as that we have a nice unconscious behind here, um, and then uh, the the analyst gets these sort of nodal points that we call symptoms, and you open them up and you can see the unconscious behind uh, the symptom. You know, for, uh, Lacan very famously says, and you know, we're talking about the early and middle Lacan here that the repressed and the return of the repressed are the same thing. Right. So when you're talking about the parapraxis, that is the, the 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 erupt, that is the unconscious. The unconscious is the parapraxis. The unconscious is this thing. But not only this, there's a long, um, you know, even today we talk about the symptom. You know, you find it everywhere with, with the culture of pathology and the commodification of symptoms as such, where we see them as, well, that isn't me. This symptom isn't me. This symptom, this thing that I have, it's something that I can enjoy. It's something that I can take. It's something that I can use. It's something I can talk about, but it isn't me. And, you know, it's not me at all. And I'm not going to respond to it. I'm going to be able to work with it in some way, but it's not mine. One of the things that you get from psychoanalysis with uh, the, the shift from the ego to the subject is that, no, this symptom, this thing, that that that's that we this thing that that it that's interruptive this thing that's difficult that we can't that is you and you have to be able to respond to it there is a, a, a you know to deal with the fact that we are uh not masters in our own house but we still have to take responsibility now what's interesting is that um you've got i was speaking to you before about uh john betts's new book allow christ the logos of creation and in classical theology you know we talk about god essence and his existence right essence and his existence are one and um what betts says is that we need to start speaking about uh god's essence as the sort of primordial ground and god's existence and you know since it's his action we speak of that as the logos the christ and so what he argues is that christ is god's existence and you can't think of them separately to the extent that he follows some patristics here that if Christ didn't exist and neither would the father, you'd say, you'd say that. So when you're seeing Christ, you are seeing the action of the father. And since God's action and his essence are one and the same, you can't make um, a, a, a distinction between them. And so Betts argues, and I'm probably getting the argument slightly off here, but he's, he argues that the, the, the divine logos and the logos is is you know the reason that's suffused throughout creation, but it's also found in the incarnation of Christ. When you are seeing that singularity, you are seeing God. And if you want to take that um, as a symptom, um, insofar that the symptom is not separate from uh, the divine hypostasis or whatever you want to call it, then yeah, you you can see. I would say you can see an, an analogy. There's something analogous there. I wouldn't say it's one and the same, but there's something analogous there. <laughs> Can I make two brief points? Uh, you inspired me, Mark. Um, very brief points, and I, I won't explain how they're related because it'll take too much time. The first one is, um, uh, let, let's start with uh, Islam and um, God is not lacking. Um, in Islam, there's a oneness to God that's been uh, isolated um, from his prophets. It doesn't mean there's not communication. God communicates uh, through uh, the angel Gabriel to the prophet in Islam, for example. Um, it's humans that have lack in Islam. Humans fail, and it's precisely because they can fail that they are superior creatures in Islam. That's fascinating to me. Angels are perfect because they perfectly execute the commandments of God. There's nothing lacking. So they are actually not as superior as humans. Um, I find that fascinating to me. So uh, it's, in Islam, it's the failure that makes all the lack. So not the failure. It's, it's the refusal of failure 
um, uh, despite the fact that you could have all, okay, humanity exists against the backdrop of failure, but it's in spite of that, by uh, by acting according to uh, God's uh, commandments, that you can pass the test. So you're always against the backdrop of failure, but but you can you have to pass the test. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, in Christianity, it's a little different, uh, depending upon your, uh, you know, in Catholicism, I would go to confession, for example. There are certain sins that are unforgivable in, in Catholicism, but many of them are quite forgivable. And also in Islam, some of them are forgivable. But my point is that it's a different conception of God, I think, and we have to take it as such. Yet it's the same God that we see in all the other world religions. It's the same God in Christianity. It's the same God in Judaism. Of course, Islam sees itself as the last chapter uh, of the Abrahamic uh, trilogy, the last and final uh, chapter. But what type of God do you have in Hinduism? Well, it depends because I, I became quite fascinated when I was living in India with the... Uh, uh, the lingus, what do you call the, the first word? It's, I mean, it's it's a, it's a Hindu god who's represented as a phallus. Yet there's also a, a tray around the phallus, uh, which is meant to represent the sexual rapport. Mm -hmm. Unlike, un, 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 uh, not like what you think uh, you know about Lacan, the Lacan of the non-rapport, the one is a, is a rapport. Uh, there is a rapport. Oh, I think that this is, I think this is, yeah. You know, the, the, the rapport is the symptom. You can have sex. Uh, it's a question of how and in what dimension, what register. And what type of God you see in this is a God that's represented as a God uh, that has a fusional oneness to it. Yeah. Uh, and there can be no symptom because there's no excess because whatever comes out of the phallus falls into the tray and remains there. So, so this is why you have tribes on the outside of Delhi, for example, that are uh, quite admired by the prime minister of India who will drink their own urine, sit on dead bodies and meditate. Uh, they keep their objects in their pocket. The so other God, point... So the other yeah, yeah. Uh, the other point that I wanted to mention was even briefer, thankfully, and it's on the question of the uh, the repressed and the return of the repressed are the same thing. We should ask ourselves why Lacan felt the need to say that. Where else did he talk about the return of something? And it was in foreclosure. What's foreclosed in the symbolic returns in the real, and that was the definition of foreclosure which is not only operative in psychosis. Foreclosure is operative, I would say, in my research, in all clinical structures, and we find evidence of this in Lacan's teaching. It's a question of where the foreclosure is. You can have foreclosure of the nom de pair in psychosis. You, have, you can have foreclosure of the signifier of the woman. You can have foreclosure of the woman in all speaking beings, which we all foreclose the woman. Um, so it's a question of where foreclosure is. So what does it mean to say return, uh, repression and return of the repressed are one and the same thing? Uh, one interpretation, perhaps it's the wrong one, is that what is, return, what, what is repressed returns where? In a blunder, in a speech, in the real. In other words, repression is its own type of madness, just as uh, modern nation states are just as futile and dark as, as uh, what pre-existed them. We just like to believe otherwise. That's the power of belief. No, no I think it's, it's uh, a not, it got me thinking uh, about the return of the, the, uh, the repressed, about, you know, Cadell was saying about the, uh, Christ as symptom. And, you know, I was trying to relate that to the question of God's essence and his existence, Christ being God's ex existence as the eternal Logos, which, which you know, the Logos creates everything. Um, and then enters creation um, connected with the power of the Holy Spirit and then returns everything back to God into that oneness. So you have that logic of the return back into the one. But I was going to say... Before, yeah. be, sorry to interrupt, but before um, Logos was light in, the, in Genesis, Genesis 1, 
three years. Oh, or... I mean, yeah, if you go go both back and you can, um, you know, what, uh, if it's a biblical hermeneutics and stuff, you know, there's uh, what we, you know, yeah, we end up sort of uh, reading, you know, reading in 1 John. Um, the reading that we have in 1 John is retroactively read back into, uh, into Genesis. You know, so it's like, it's like if you go and take the, uh, the Bible uh, as as it's read by you know Jewish people you know the Tanakh that 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 uh, Greek logos uh, theology just isn't you know it's not there you know it's uh, but if you're taking it from you know the Catholic tradition then they will ultimately read these 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 texts in a way that are Christocentric they will do it and say so, you know this is the 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 reality of 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 biblical hermeneutics and its relation to tradition and patristic theology. Uh, there was one other thing I was going to, I was talking about, you were talking about the lingus um, and how you were saying that this, this is representative of a type of pantheistic oneness. And, you know, what I, what I think, you know, it's, it's like with Catholic Christianity is that you do have uh, the tradition of the, the non-report insofar that, you know, creation, creation and God are ultimately different. They are ultimately different, but there is something of a relation. But that relation is caught up in a type of, um, you know, positivization of failure. There is this uh, in, in so far that we what who do we relate to? We relate to uh, this incarnated Greek a person called Christ and this idea that we relate to God, not by becoming fusionally um, absorbed into him, but we keep our creatureliness. Uh, but at the same time, it's in our creatureliness that we ultimately still relate fully to God. So it's it's a it's a unity in difference. Whilst in uh, Hinduism, that uh, that non-report or non-relation isn't there, and it's a more of a of a of a, of a, of a oneness that you were saying is represented of the lingas. What would you say is the difference then in in your interpretation in in, in Islam? What's the relation there? Uh, that would take me a long time to answer. No, um, it's just, 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 just an interest. But, just, but I, I would say, though, to begin with what you said about Hinduism, I quite agree with Arka uh, Chattopadeya, who is a um, great Lacanian scholar at IIT in Gandhinagar. Uh, who writes a lot on Beckett and mathematics, and now he's going in the direction of Badu more and more, I've noticed. A friend of mine, um, uh, he was, I, I interviewed him for the European Journal of Psychoanalysis a couple of years ago, and he described India, don't take this in a negative way, as uh, he said, uh, it, it, there's a lot of, in, uh, of an inc psychoanalytically incestuous um, uh, this. And I think what he meant there, yes. in my interpretation, is, of course, that you begin with the rapport, mm -hmm. uh, just like how in Islam, in the seven, in the story of the seven sleepers of the cave, I love the way Islam deals with caves as a counterpoint to the Platonic and Christian emphasis on caves. Mm -hmm. um, you don't come out of caves enlightened. You run into the cave for protection from a world that's saturated in paganistic jouissance. Mm. Um, and this is what you get in the Islamic interpretation of the seven sleepers of, of the cave. And so it becomes a question of how to produce lack, how to, how to, uh, how to face the Freudian unconscious when it's ultimately gone missing when you've unsubscribed from the Freudian unconscious, how to face the Freudian unconscious. And of course, for the seven sleepers of the cave in the Islamic narrative, um, they run away from the pagan world, retreat into a cave, which I call a prison of their own choosing, and they sleep. And guess what? They can dream. They dream. And in the Quran, it says, we don't know, only God knows how long they, they were dreaming. Um, and um, for them, this was how they found belief. The only way they could believe was to find their cave. It's quite different uh, than how you might uh, articulate the act for Christ or Christians, or how you might articulate the act or the pass for a, um, uh, a Jew in, in this way of uh, describing it. So um, 
I don't think the Islamic God is an incestuous uh, one. I think it's one that begins from uh, with the commandment to read. It's not the first surah in the Quran, but it was the first message delivered uh, to the prophet. Read. Of course, he was illiterate. He didn't know how to read. So it becomes a question. Read what? Read the signs. And when we read the unconscious in the, le in the last paradigm of Jewish Psalms, we're not read when we say reading the unconscious as opposed to interpreting the unconscious. You're reading uh, Jewish Psalms. You're reading the spaces where uh, uh, meaning is falling away. So, uh, yeah, that's all. Oh, I can that's just wonderful. I mean, it's, it's, uh, no, it just got me uh, you know, thinking in regards to the, the paradigm that we're in, in so far that we don't have mediation there's immediacy saturation human songs and we have different modalities of expression of the symbolic within you know these various religions and you know we can say that we're sort of you know boundarizing these things but we're just using it as sort of heuristic devices to be able to get a grip on on these things and with christianity you have you know um a symbolic of a unity in difference how we can relate with a non-rapport and i think you know uh, lacan is ultimately you know, he finds that in the expression of, of Seminar 20, you know, obviously at a structural level. And then I was reflecting on the the, the saturation of the linguists, you know, the, the one of the symptom. There is a relationship, but also with that relationship, there is silence. You know, there isn't a speech. And I was I was trying to categorize from there how to think about the, the communicative reality of Islam, which you 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 know explained it succinctly for me in terms, it's got something to do with uh, the importance of place of of, of silence, the cave, um, the idea of reading. Uh, yeah, obviously it's got a question of the of the uh, the. I think the key term here is uh, the centrality of revelation. You know, we can't talk. And I think going back, I think going back to psychoanalysis, what is the key thing it's psycho and people go to psychoanalysis they go into the cave why do they go into the cave they go into a cave for a revelation you know a revelation of a symptom something that comes that's something that they won't understand you know it's I mean, I'm, I'm just i'm i'm, I'm ad living here <laughs> yeah. i feel like this is this has gone this has gone ended up pretty pretty meta in some sense you know we're 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 st stumbling stumbling through the you know, let's say the the excess positivity of our, our of our inability to sort of find a, a, a name of the father to 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 mediate our experience of 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 present day reality let's say especially in a global context um, especially in a global context between sort of the the all breaking and 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 the foams now being active I feel like there's so much more to explore and potentially we will. I mean, I would just sort of open this as a sort of, um, I would say an open invitation that we might want to use this book, Negativity and Psychoanalysis, to continue exploring some of these themes that seem to be exploding uh, at the end of our discourse here. Um, but in sort of the spirit of, of bringing this to its proper closure, I would just like to ask you both to sort of give me your sort of um, takeaway for the the viewers um, in terms of maybe how they should go into to negativity and psychoanalysis, how they should approach negativity and psychoanalysis just as sort of a, a closing gesture, because I think the framing of our current situation being this sort of actually excessive positivity uh, in an immediacy, which is sort of struggling to find the negative capacities to mediate uh, is is sort of for me a sort of essential takeaway that can um, perhaps guide some readers as they move through the text itself. Um, Dwayne, if you want to sort of start with you, then we'll go to Mark and then wrap yeah, it up. Yeah, I would say um, uh, it, it, uh, one way to look at the book uh, is to, you could literally choose a chapter at random and read it uh, because uh, I don't think you're going to find a lot of people that are working through the same questions. Each author is bringing their own question. 
And that question is not always in relation to what I had imagined it would be. Um, and each author is working through that question on their own terms with their own reference points. Some of them are not even Freudian or Lacanian. Uh, and I can't think of a way to say that there is a project that brings them all together. The book is titled Negativity and Psychoanalysis, but it's really a bunch of pieces. All of these chapters, they're pieces. Um, they happen to be within a bounded volume, which may or may not have been a mistake for the transmission of psychoanalysis. Um, but each one has their own point of view. You can find some ways of thematizing them, which Mark and I tried to do. I think we did it to the best of our ability. I think we've both tried. I don't mean to speak for Mark, but I think we've both tried in our way, despite what it seems like coming on the podcast, to let each author speak for themselves uh, without imposing a general vision. In the preface, I have my idea because I didn't write a chapter. Uh, but if you read the preface thinking that what I'm saying in the preface is going to be reflected in the book, uh, you won't, you'll be disappointed. <laughs> because we have people that it seems to us are dealing with um, sociology, theology, and so on. But in each their own way, they're dealing with, uh, I wouldn't say the concept of negativity, but the question of negativity. Um, in whatever, uh, with whatever our go, with whatever language that they have at their disposal, which is unique to them. I think everybody in the book is babbling, and that includes myself, and I don't mean that to disparage the content. Uh, so, um, but if I can, I'll tell you what I learned about negativity. What I learned was that um, I know less now about negativity than, than um, I knew before. And the preface is an obvious reflection of uh, my own stupidity. Mark, what do you think? I think that, you know, you, you uh, hit the nail on the head. I think there's two things that need to be uh, separated, don't we? I think the uh, talking about the conditions of the emergence of the book, which, you know, comes from our own anxiety about the question of negativity in you know where where we are today you know and, and the what, you know questions of con const constitutive negativity and uh positivity and then the birth of the book itself and you know what the title is you know psychoanalysis and negativity um what we have is ultimately you know the largest signifiers that broadly bring about the question of psychoanalysis as such so the people who have come and put together this term, we've been inv invited them to talk about you know things of what we think are senior importance of of what you know, what binds or what makes psychoanalysis the place of negativity in in you know in the psychoanalytic or the, or the tradition as such, and each of those things come at very different process. My own thing, I t I started you know talking about uh, uh, how we can link uh, Freud's concept of negativity in the unconscious and linking that to the wider um, apophatic tradition in Christianity. And that's in entirely different from, you know, the more clinical orientations in the book. And that's the other thing that binds it. And I think that this is what makes it a bit different than other books. What it does is it tries to, you know, it tries to, you know, we have, the, you know, for a long time, we've seen a dualism in, you know, the, the, um, the world of psychoanalysis and theory is that you've got the the theory philosophical reception of Lacan here, you know, uh, and uh, and then you've got the the more clinical, you know, the clinical school over here, and, the, and you know the books were in, in separate places. You know, you wouldn't you go you get your uh, your more clinical orientated stuff from from Karnak, you know, <laughs> it's uh, uh whilst you go and get your uh, your more your more um, theoretical. Uh, stuff from uh, repeated books or something I, but it's it's what you what we're trying to show is that this this division there is a division and there is a separation 
but it's important to be able, I think, to bring these two things into one volume. And, you know, maybe this is reflective of what we were just talking about before about oscillation. You know, it's this idea of, you know, not, not, uh, not, not, you know, making a dialectical, you know, pancake. You know, it's not that, you know, we're not doing that, but we're trying to show a, a, an essential unity and difference that we can see a conversation there. And, you know, each of the, this conversation isn't a collapsing into one beautiful, you know, over and systematic exposition on negativity, but it needs to be seen no. one by one, one by one. I don't know. Maybe I, <laughs> maybe I, I just want to sort of selfishly add that you, even if you are making a dialectical pancake, you should anyway shit out the pancake. That's it. We should. We should. <laughs> yeah, I'll put it in my I'll pocket. I gotta right? end it. I gotta end I'll it with a joke. <laughs> end it with the joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put the book in your pocket. Read it one by one. All that stuff is great. Look, you guys have been fantastic. I've enjoyed immensely. Um, not only having a chance to 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 speak with you formally for the first time, Dwayne, but also sort of seeing you guys both bounce off of each other in a very productive way, uh, oscillate off of each other in a very productive way, maybe we could say. And uh, I'm very open to ways we can keep on bringing this this book, uh, making this book come alive in different ways. So um, thanks to both of you for your time. Uh, thanks to our uh, listeners for, for their time and uh, for everyone still with us. Uh, have a great evening. For courses exploring the foundation of modern philosophy, as well as live events bringing philosophy to life, visit philosophyportal.online and become a member today. Throughout 2024, our members get access to four monthly events. In March, we focus on the concept of the sacred and welcome guests Andrew Davis, Ruth E. Kastner, and Matthew Segal. Find out more at philosophyportal.online.